Hi everyone, welcome to another Ask Me Anything. The first question this week comes from Jack. Jack says, hey James, do you have any thoughts as to the positives and negatives between pure chemical psilocybin and naturally sourced psilocybin containing mushrooms? What, if any, effect uh, could this have on the experiences themselves? Um, yeah, I think I spoke about something related to this uh, in a recent AMA, um, the idea as to whether there's some kind of spirit or essence to the, um, to the whole mushroom. And the way that I think about that is in terms of an entourage effect. So if you think about cannabis, pure THC uh, is a different experience to THC combined with CBD, which is another cannabinoid that is, is found in cannabis. So the plants tend to have multiple chemicals that might have psychoactive effects. I don't know in psilocybin if there are any other kind of psychedelic chemicals that are thought to have um, significant effects. Um, it's not something people report on, so I'm assuming there's nothing kind of majorly interesting going on there. But it's not out of the question that there could be some difference to having you know, all of the chemicals that come with the whole mushroom, um, as opposed to just having pure synthesized psilocybin. Um, Maria Sabina, the Mexican curandero who introduced magic mushrooms into the West, she was given the synthesized version, it was synthesized by Albert Hoffman, and she said something about um, that the spirit of the little children, which is what they call the mushrooms, um, was inside the, the pill that she was given. So she seemed to think it was the same, the same thing. And most of us would agree that the trip is very similar. I think, you know, if you if you had synthesized versus um, the whole kind of, the whole mushroom. There are going to be kind of expectation effects, you know, like um, I think in Michael Pollan's book, he spoke about, in his experiences, the substances he was given, even if it was a tab of LSD, was often presented in a cup in a kind of ceremonial way. And he wrote about the, he felt it was important to really chew down the whole, the whole mushroom and that, that, gave you this feeling of communing with the natural world and reminds you where this comes from. I think there's power to that, um, to remembering that this is something you are engaging with another organism when you eat a mushroom. Um, I don't know if it necessarily has to be kind of chewing on a gnarly <laughs> mushroom that can produce nausea, but uh, I think that's something to, to be aware of. Um, I don't think there's anything supernatural going on. Um, if people claim to have different experiences uh, with naturally sourced mushrooms, um, but yeah, so I mean, the negatives of having naturally sourced mushrooms is you get often kind of nausea and these other effects of breaking down, I think it's the keratin, this kind of hard stuff in the organic matter. Um, so you might want to avoid that with a synthesized version. Um, it makes sense that they do that in studies to be more precise as well. You know, there's another benefit of synthesized is that you get precise measurements. Um, but yeah, so these are just mild differences and I think it's worth having both options available to people um, because they might suit different people at different times. Um, Jack also says, many users of psilocybin containing mushrooms report experiences where they feel uh, like they're communicating directly with some kind of mushroom intelligence slash consciousness. What are your thoughts uh, on the nature of these experiences? Do you believe plant consciousness is directly interacting with human consciousness um, are these experiences entirely caused by the human mind? Are these experiences caused by something entirely beyond the human mind? Yeah, so the most plausible um, explanation to me is that as social creatures, we're kind of dramatizing whatever it is we're processing in a way where we feel like there's an intelligent other, that we're kind of bouncing off this, our ideas in this kind of communicative way. Uh, in the same way that when you dream, it's it's rare to just have dreams of yourself alone in desolate landscapes. We tend to dream about interacting with people, with you know animals, with whatever, to figure out how we feel. We're, we're fundamentally interactive creatures as living things. We interact with our environment and others. So I think that's the most likely explanation. I don't see a mechanism for kind of you know consciousness doesn't directly communicate with other forms of consciousness. You know I can't telepathically communicate with you. It needs to be the intermediary of, of kind of activity in the physical world, as far as we know. And if that were the case, you could say, well, eating the mushroom is the intermediary. Um, but the mechanism, you know, if the psilocybin was like the sound waves are right now, as I'm modulating them to change the activity in your eardrum and change your consciousness, if the psilocybin was like that, you'd expect the mechanism to, of action to be a lot more complex than it is. You have this really simple lock and key mechanism with psychedelics, uh, 
and if there's something if there's like another channel of information transmission going on we haven't found it yet we've not seen any signal at all uh, in the objective kind of that person physical description of the world but if people feel like they're having these experiences subjectively um yeah it so easily could be the mind dramatizing its own contents that we would need to find some physical signature of this activity and we've seen nothing like that so far it's not impossible um as far as i'm concerned you know you can you can feel co- it's easy to feel comfortable that we have the whole world figured out and you know people felt that way when they thought that the uh, earth was the center of the universe and then suddenly something comes along and you realize there are a whole thing you know swathes of reality that you hadn't recognized so stuff like that could be going on but I, we just don't see any evidence for it so far in the objective world description of the world um next we have tiger tiger says hi james uh there are many case reports of people saying they've entered the dmt realm by taking high doses of psilocybin um would you have any idea why um why it is that the experiences with with psilocybin can be of a completely different nature above a certain dose yeah so it is strange that you know you go up to a kind of four gram dose of kind of mushrooms which is roughly the equivalent amounts of the side they use in the studies and you can tend to have these kind of mystical experiences um this kind of ego dissolution uh, where there's less kind of content or it's less about the content and then you go up from there and then people report having these entity encounters strange going to other dimensions is what it feels like and for me i've always passed through um kind of on the come up with suicide and there always seems to be some kind of elf like um beings kind of just out of sight which is something you don't have with things like lsd typically um so yeah there is this um this strange inhabited feeling sometimes to the psychological spaces you go to on psilocybin and i think it was terence mckenna had a conversation with albert hoffman and uh i think albert hoffman said that the reason he preferred lsd to psilocybin is that the psilocybin experience feels alive or animate in a way that lsd doesn't and he found that kind of unnerving if i'm remembering that correctly um so yeah that i think that is definitely a feature of it uh it's hard to say why that is for psilocybin versus lsd um when it comes to the question that you asked of why it's more likely with a higher dose well you know we tend to think about scientific you know it's a kind of scientific sense we tend to think about psychedelics affecting our modeling of the world and you can imagine that at um lower doses up to kind of what you might call you know middle to high doses you're mainly dissolving your preconceptions dissolving your models and then you could be tapping into a process where the modeling actually goes overboard and you start generating a lot of content um that could be because you're tapping into other models you didn't know were there um inside yourself or it could be a kind of rebound effect where the system really decide it kind of recognizes that it's really dissolving and it really needs to kind of um, respond with this kind of counter over modeling that's the kind of way i would think about it and i'm trying to form formalize these ideas in some work at the moment um which you will be the first to know about uh okay and then we have sam who says hi james i've recently watched your videos on your approach to psychedelic healing and have a couple of related questions firstly you outline the importance of maintaining an attitude of groundedness um, and presence during the experience moving towards whatever emotions arise uh, sounds like good advice um would you still recommend entering into the experience with this uh, singular intention or would you suggest dropping any form of intention and expectation and just working through whatever psychological material arises spontaneously yeah that's an excellent question um so there's no ready-made answer for this i'm a big fan of um trying to package these kinds of things in ways that are very streamlined and one size fits all and can you know take out unnecessary complexity but the question you're asking really it comes down to a skillful process that will vary from person to person from trip to trip um as to how they're navigating their own issues and, you know i mean this is something i've really come to realize while i've been working for a, a while now with with some people kind of offering kind of coaching in the form of you know psychedelic integration um after the experiences and yeah i've realized that there's no real shortcut here you really need to wisely skillfully um approach each thing in its own way so 
most of the time I would say an intention is good. Most of the time having a sense of what the things are that you're most troubled by or want to improve or focus on is, is good to go in with. And then just not to hold on to it too tightly. So you might go in thinking you have, that you want to feel sadness, you know, you want to grieve something you've not really had time to, um, to process something you feel sad about. And then you might be struck by actually you feel anger towards someone close to you. Uh, and then the whole trip is actually about that anger that, would, that you need to address first. Um, that can happen a lot. So I guess having an intention, setting a course, but not holding onto it too tightly is probably what I would advise. Um, so that way you are still allowing the material to arise spontaneously, um, but you're not going in aimlessly. Um, I, wouldn't, I generally wouldn't recommend going in aimlessly. Even if you thought you didn't have any emotional material to work through, I would go in with the intention of mindfully surrendering so you kind of can just be present in a kind of non-dual state ultimately, and then you'll see what comes up on the way. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sam also says, secondly, I'd like to know more about how you integrate the insights gained from these experiences into daily life. In my experience, even the most profound insights can quickly be forgotten once we re-enter life in a society which often operates at odds to living in a healthy way. Have you found any effective methods of integrating insights so they remain beneficial in the long term? Thanks. Yeah, so, I mean, again, this is um, this is an answer where the answer is complexity rather than simplicity. Uh, because, to me, life becomes integration, really. The way you live your life in every single moment becomes an act of trying to wisely embody the insights you've had. Um, in and out of psychedelic states. So everything becomes far more integrated and whole and there's not these differentiations between, oh, I had this experience and now I'm, you know, going to try and integrate it for 10 minutes in the morning with my meditation or, you know. So one of the like main, you know, generally what we're doing is emotional work. We're trying to understand our subjective felt responses to what goes on as we live our lives. Um, so as you feel anything about in, in your day, if there's any, um, even the mildest potential for conflict or discomfort emotionally, those are opportunities to, to move in the direction that the insights have kind of shown you that, the, that would be wise for your, for your flourishing and the flourishing of others. Um, so yeah, it just becomes an ongoing practice. And that's why, you know, I think kind of classic psychotherapy is really powerful in this way just having a having a therapeutic space once a week where some where you can go and um talk to someone who just can hold the space some that's the main skill i think a therapist needs is just to feel safe um they don't need to be a kind of genius of of psychology but obviously some psychological understanding is a necessity for the job um but if they just feel like a safe caring person that's something where you can go once a week and and it kind of keeps you moving forward, keeps you kind of probing into your shadow material and, and figuring out where you need to, to focus on. And often some things only come up in that interactive way. So while you're doing the kind of core of this work and figuring out the landscape of your own emotional um, subjective states, then yeah, making an ongoing process and using tools like therapy and um, journaling is another one that people find very helpful. Uh, so yeah, the, the, this is the more the bigger question of of um, the ongoing integration, rather than me just saying, well, if you've had a non-dual experience, maybe meditation. If you've realised you're holding a lot of tension in your body as a response to kind of not feeling your emotions, then do yoga and, and maybe tremoring exercises. You know, all this kind of you know uh, the more specific things. Um, yeah, but it really. It, I'm sorry that I can't give you a nice, neat answer, but um, it really just becomes an ongoing process. Uh, recording them, writing them down, is, I find useful, but I never actually return to those notes. Um, yeah. And uh, next we have Joe Mikowski. Joe says, hi James, I was wondering if you can try to articulate what is going on in our th uh, when our thoughts uh, settle during meditation from a science perspective. Good question. Um, so if you think of thoughts as the activity of the mind when it's in motion and it's 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 in a kind of goal-directed state even if it's subtly even if you're sitting there on the bus and you have nothing to do um 
if you're fantasizing about the future or reflecting on the past, you're kind of subtly trying to assess or process information so that you can improve in future. There's some kind of goal there implicitly. So there's all this kind of activity. And then when you when you meditate, fundamentally what you're trying to do is you're trying to stop and be present. Um, and so when the thoughts die away, you're just um, you're stopping that process of the activity. And the thing that's really interesting is that it turns out that, you know, experience, raw experience is not dependent on thinking. Now to this audience at this point, this may feel trivial and obvious and kind of, why would you ever think that you need to think hard to taste the taste of coffee? You know, experience is far more fundamental and uh, feels more real than just abstractions. But to most people, they're kind of surprised when they first have a non-dual experience and they realize, huh, I can actually quiet down the thinking and the world is still here and it kind of shines forth radiantly in this beautiful, blissful way. Um, so that, that, you know, that's why it's, it's, it's profound. But it's also, I mean, <laughs> I don't want the answer to sound too trivial, but it's almost like saying, like, what happens when someone stops running? You're like, well, they were running and then now they're not running. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the relevant thing here would be if someone was running for their life because they were, um, it had become a habit out of fear, but now the feared thing was, is gone. If they're still running and they're afraid they'll die if they stop, if they stop and they realize their heart's still beating, they're still breathing, they didn't need to be, to be running. That's a similar kind of insight um, to the power that you can have in these meditative states. So maybe the the harder question is what is thinking and, and that's that's not what you asked and that's a, a difficult question um to answer and you know i could like i said at the start it's kind of the activity at this abstracted symbolic level that tends to be to do with goal directed thought um yeah that's my my simplest answer for that uh okay next we have john award john says hi james after listening to your last podcast with james hollis I'm wondering how you integrate the Jungian perspective on the self with the non-dualistic metaphysics. As I understand it, a Jungian goal uh, might be to bring the small s self or ego into conversation with the capital S self or soul. Uh, whereas from a non-dual perspective, the goal is to realize that there is no self. Uh, do you see these goals as being contradictory or are there, are there different ways of expressing similar aims? Do you see a living mirror theory as a way of bridging these different schools of thought? Thanks, James. Yeah, so... <sighs> I don't see them as, as contradictory. I, because I, I don't, you know, James Hollis was kind of clear when he used, he used the word soul in our conversation and he was clear that this is metaphorical. And yeah, the thing is, is everything is metaphor really. There are no, at an absolute level, there are no things. Uh, on the absolute level, there's just existence. And then on the conventional level, we use these conventions of saying, you know, I'll call that bit of the tree, the apple. And you know, that means you can eat that bit as opposed to the twig even though from an absolute perspective, it's all part of the same life process. That's the same thing as you and me. Um, so if you appreciate that and you're rigorous about saying, well, the self is just a convention, it's just a, a relative term to say, you know, James, not, you know, not Jono. Those are relative terms to discriminate in that kind of discriminative way um, rather than just the absolute thing where we're all, we're all the same. So I don't see a contradiction. I think it's useful to think in terms of the you know, I do think that the self exists at the relative level. Um, well, and maybe that's overstating its existence a bit, but it's not It's not that it entirely doesn't exist. It's just if you think it is a thing that, and it fundamentally exists, that's the confusion. Um, so when it comes to my theory, I think my theory, the mirror theory offers a kind of, you know, it's fundamentally showing, arguing how consciousness comes into existence in a non-dual perspective. Um, that's not just like idealistic um, in the philosophical sense, the metaphysical sense. Um, so I, I think, you know, when you think of something like um, witness consciousness, sometimes people talk about in things like internal family systems, where this is like a kind of a, a, a capital S self, that's the kind of consciousness that we have and that we share with every living thing, in my opinion, uh, that feels like this kind of eye of the universe um, that feels like the kind of eye of God just like watching everything and then within that um, all the drama of the small self plays out so it gives a scientific way of thinking about what's going on there um, so yeah you could say it also because it's linked to the separation of individual life forms you can also say well why that's why 
that the life form then develops a psychological sense of self that it mistakes for being for being real because it needs to in order to survive. Um, so yeah, I think you could use that as a framework to explain the difference between those. Yeah. Okay. Next we have Patrick T. Patrick says um, this question goes back to the last question. As that was last time, I think Patrick asked about dukkha, uh, the idea in Buddhism that kind of suffering or unsatisfactoriness is intrinsic to existence. Um, so this goes back to the last question where you said that, well, the universe itself is um, is not itself full of suffering. There's a lot uh, of suffering for embodied creatures like us. Well, uh, true in a sense, to me it seems uh, like the good side easily outweighs the negative, even when only minor medit- even with only minor meditation practice. Uh, in my case, I wonder what you think about that. Also, in regards uh, to having kids and your own and your view on death that you usually describe as something positive rather than rather than being trapped in the shithole for endless existence. I think that's not quite how I <laughs> expressed it myself, but um, I see what you mean. Um, I'm interested in yeah, whether you view dukkha uh, in a life-affirming or life-negating way. Sorry, I read that quite badly. But I hope that came across. So, um, yeah, this this idea of... Is it largely... I guess optimistic or pessimistic, positive or negative. To me, it, it's kind of just a fact. You know, I I think that the struggle that produces suffering is a necessary precondition for consciousness to exist uh, in a, in our universe that's kind of moving towards disorder. I think that's it's in that activity in that struggle that you get consciousness. So I think it just happens to be our circumstance. And then I think whether we project our suffering onto the nature of the whole universe, as happens with nihilism, where we think, you know, um, we've not resolved and come to terms with and accepted our suffering and we just think oh, the whole thing is, is terrible. Um, or the other extreme, we, we live in a fantasy world where actually it's all predetermined in the most blissful, positive way and God knows what's best and it works in mysterious ways. Both of those are projections. And so I would say the the unsatisfactoriness or struggle or suffering of being a living system is just it's just our circumstance and the thing to do is to do the, the healing work where you or the emotional growth work where you just come to terms with accepting what is and feeling your emotions um around that so yeah i think i mean you mentioned death as well i mean i i think it's um I wouldn't describe it as yeah, being trapped in this shithole. I don't think about the universe as a shithole. It seems quite Eden-like a lot of the time to me. Um, and I think, yeah, it's death is, is, you know, it's not positive or negative on the ultimate level. It just is on the relative level. Yeah, it's largely, it's the thing we want to avoid most of all. But if you really think about it, you know, my, my stance is that someone like me a human being is built to last for probably less than 100 years and if you could physically make me last longer my mental state would probably break down and you're trying to resist the natural flow and context of of this process and you're trying to keep it going up for an artificially long time and it's just going to cause discord you may as well let that particular iteration of this activity of life go away and let a new one come and luckily that's what happens when you have kids so to me it seems um like a very positive natural process uh um yeah just making sure i answered your questions there uh you say in regards to having kids in your view of death uh yeah i hope i hope that answered it you could always uh pin down any particular points i didn't if i didn't answer them in the next one okay next we have paniotis paniotis says hi james um, I'd like to hear your take on repressed slash delayed grief. Uh, how can the grief process be relaunched after decades of repression? So this kind of comes down to the uh, the fact that we're constantly in motion. You know, when I think of repression, I don't think of it so much as you know, Freud was coming off the back of um, <clears throat> a kind of thermodynamic revolution in physics, and so his perspective was called psychodynamics. And the idea was very much that there are these forces in in the mind, and so you get this this repressive force that kind of pushes down the emotions, uh, whatever the, the material is. Uh, there could be something like that going on in the brain, but I think a really another useful way to think about it is that we're almost dancing around. We're constantly in motion, and we're constantly avoiding and evading these um, 
these kind of landmines of intense feeling. So, you know, for me, there was a particular song that I, an album I was listening to a lot in my teenage years when a, when a major traumatic event happened, and it took me kind of a decade and a half to realize I loved this album and I hadn't listened to it in a decade and a half, not consciously. And then when I listened to it, I was I had vivid flashbacks. And um, so that took no... I think I probably instinctively knew to avoid it. If, if any part of me... If I, if I picked up that CD, I would have gone, oh, I like the album, but I would have I would have known I didn't want to listen to it because if I went and put it in the CD player, I probably would have... My adrenaline would have started going. Pro, on, you know, things before you recognise it consciously um, probably would have stopped me. So that's a kind of avoidance rather than repression. And then... So then I think when you stop and you do this kind of work where you're trying to just be still and be present, that's probably why all this stuff suddenly comes out. Um, it's why some people can't bear to, to meditate and be just be with themselves. Um, it's why a lot of people are terrified of psychedelics because they take you into this material um, sometimes. So I think that's why suddenly you could be avoiding and holding on to this emotion. And then if you suddenly stop and start grieving, then you've made, you've made no progress the whole time you've been holding it. You know that phrase, what resists persists. Um, so yeah, it's a, you, people can live their entire lives grieving things, resisting grieving things, sorry. Um, whereas actually if you allow yourself to feel, feel the feelings that move through you, they move through you. Um, okay, Paniotis also says, peak experiences during psychedelics that feel like all of previous life experience was just leading to that exact moment. What can we bring back out of an experience like this? Yeah, I mean, I, I used to have that experience in conversation with people, just kind of normal, ordinary conversations. It would occur to me that every single thing they'd gone through in their life had taken them to that moment where they're talking to me. It felt suddenly like a lot of pressure to um, to be worthy of, of just, you know, their uh, engagement, just with, yeah, random people. And um, it felt very poignant and, like, we're always living at this crest of a wave, like, at the real cutting edge of existence. Um, I'm not sure what to take away from that. It's kind of... It felt more like a kind of just an awe state of reflecting on what the hell's going on in existence <laughs> um, and empathizing with other people on their, their journey in life. So I don't know if there's anything that you can put into words that's meaningful. Um, there's also, you know, there can be a lot of illusory effect going on here where you're in a psychedelic state and things are kind of saturating your meaning signaling and sometimes it just feels um, very meaningful. I mean. The sense in which it can connect you with a true sense of overwhelming meaning in the present moment is that this is where life is lived. It's always in the present moment. So you could be connecting with that. And then you could tell a narrative of how everything's been leading up to this point. But the same thing would be true 10 minutes later, a year later. Um, so I would focus more on the, the feeling of the awe of just existing in the present moment. Um, okay, Paniotis also says, um, early memory recovery on psychedelics, even very fine little details remembered. Can these memories and fine details be trusted? I mean, if you're having fine details that suggest there could be a vivid kind of um, trauma memory or something, or some, signif you know, some significant uh, signal that's meant you need to store this memory vividly, um, but at the same time, you can't just take it as if it's a photograph, you know, it's like critical evidence of something. Um, and usually the details aren't the thing that matter too much. It's usually your emotional, how you feel about it now. Um, and what it tells you, even if you had um, almost an entirely false memory about someone, usually that will be recreated in line with your attitude and your feelings about them. So if someone has you know, bad intentions for you, you're more likely to believe that some, they, did, they harmed you in some way. Um, but yeah, when you have the details, I think that generally would suggest that there probably was some real event. But you can fill in those details as well. There's a lot of studies on, on that. Um, so yeah, it can't be trusted absolutely. Um, and just also says psychological destabilization after science meditation retreats. Um, how can one come to balance after an intense science meditation retreat? I mean, ideally, the meditation retreat will be bringing you balance. If it's not, then I mean, you, so meditation is is effectively really deep grounding. You're just being present and feeling grounded and safe and it gets a bit weird because sometimes you can notice that there is no absolute ground in existence and you get 
and you, it feels very groundless, just the flow of phenomena. But you can find ground in that groundlessness. Um, if that's not happening and the isolation feels kind of stressful and the, the interiority of it all feels stressful and you feel very alone with it, then that's destabilizing. And so the thing to do would be to catch that through the retreat um, and go easy on yourself and don't just push yourself, push through it, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, ideally you, <clears throat> you come back feeling grounded, but if you don't, it can actually be useful to do the opposite of what the meditation retreat did and just connect with people and um, engage in normal conversation. Do, do That could be the kind of grounding you might need. Um, yeah. And then finally, uh, Stephen says, Hey James, no questions this time, but I wanted to share uh, this with the community. Uh, this is on Patreon. Uh, here, in case anyone hasn't seen it yet, it's beautiful. Uh, and I'll put the link in the description. It's a, um, it's a song uh, with Ram Dass and East Forest, um, the musician, and also John Hopkins, I think the musician, not the university. Um, uh, it's called Sit Around the Fire, and I'll put a, a link there. Yeah, actually, a few years ago, I was listening a lot to this collaboration with East Forest and Ram Dass before he died. Um, some really nice, nice tracks. All right, thanks, everyone. Um, I really enjoy this, as always. Uh, next one will be in two weeks and you can leave questions on the YouTube channel community or on the Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook. Thanks a lot.